Hello everybody and welcome to episode number 51 of the Wonder of Stuff podcast broadcast live on Google Hangouts on air every weekend. This is the place where you'll find news, information and commentary on science, engineering and technology from the past week and beyond and anything else that interests us from inside our tiny little human brains. My name as ever is John Gardner and to help us out on this journey to knowledge let me introduce my colleagues this week. Richard Smith and Rossi D. Say hello, chaps. Hello, hello. chaps. Jolly good. Excellent. So, um, without further ado, uh, firstly, I must apologise for the uh, me dropping off air last week. That's Windows for you. Um, but without further ado, we're going to start uh, with my topic. Now, I've called it Food Glorious Food Part 4, because I'm very good with this, because in, in you know, next week is our birthday. We've been on the air for a year. And one of the very first topics we did was um, food, bio, bio food, bio food technology, whatever you want to call it. But the um, the interest from Vice, Vice, <laughs> Vice. Where's this coming? From, from the interest from um, uh, venture capitalists is what I'm trying to say. For some reason, I came out as Vice. Um, <laughs> It'd be more exciting if Vice had been in touch about this. <laughs> The interest from venture capitalists um, into the new, the growing uh, sm companies who are, are dealing with uh, food science and how, how to make uh, more sustainable, uh, more globally aware food products um, for the growing, um, the growing amount of people that are on the planet. So, um, if you remember, so there, there's there was you know there was venture capitalist interest in Silicon Valley. Uh, there was. Uh, backing from Bill Gates, from Serge Brin, and the guys who started Twitter, they all put money into these uh, these companies. There was, the, I think, I, uh, there was three of them that I was um, I talked about, and one was Impossible Foods, which you remember that was the burger and the cheese that were from plant-based products. There was Beyond Meat who were doing um, uh, sort of general meat-based, uh, meatless meat substitute things. There was Hampton Creek who did the um, the egg-free mayonnaise and the the cookies, uh, and there's since then there's been a few other companies. There's one called a company called Kite Hill. There's a company called So Delicious. There's another one called Gardenia, and they've all been had a lot of venture capital or they've been purchased by bigger companies since since in the over the past year. Um, the the other thing we talked about was if you remember the. Um, Back in 2013, when they had the $325,000 burger, which was a, a burger in a Petri dish. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, they've actually now, this year, announced that they've now got it down to $11 a burger. So, obviously, a little bit way to go, but still quite impressive in a couple of years. Is that because the R&D is now finally paid off, is it? Or? Um, yeah, yeah, essentially. I think, I think, I think that they've taken on board what the, the, the first people said. Um, about it, which was like, yeah, the texture's there, the taste is a little bit, um, a little bit lacking because it was very, it was just muscle fibre. There was no fat in it, uh, which obviously you need in a in a burger or steak. You need you need a bit of fat in as well. Um, so I think they've they've readdressed that, and in the last in the last two years they've come up with a much better product. So we may be very well um, seeing what's happening uh, in the next year. With, with with a product from them, and I think they're a Dutch company, or Dutch um, based anyway. Um, the other ones, the Impossible Foods, well, they reckon by the by twenty by the end of twenty sixteen they'll have a product out, so you will be able to buy a burger. Um, Beyond Meat have already got stuff in the American supermarkets. Um, Hampton Creek will be bringing stuff over here. I think that's the rumor anyway. Have, have they mentioned what the price points they're aiming at? Are because Thinking about it, it's got to be aimed cheaper than meat, otherwise it won't. People won't buy it. Um, well, I, I, I think, I think it'll not be cheaper than meat to start off with. And I think mm. uh, it's, it, it all. It's economies of scale, isn't it? It's always going to be economies of scale. The more people mm. who buy it, they'll be able to reduce the price. I think people will buy it, even if it's more expensive than meat. Maybe not. Maybe not people who can't afford to spend any more, but people who can afford to spend more might. Mm. Just if they made it cheaper than meat, and make, that would make it a, a I know, but free preferable free alternative. Free-range free eggs sell pretty well. They're not cheaper than caged hen's eggs, but they sell. 
Yeah. They're very close though now because yeah. of the the. Uh, uh, still, the... Still a fair bit of difference though. It's not them caged hens. There's um, not a big difference between there's not a big difference between barn eggs and because that kind of straddles the midpoint, doesn't it? Mm. But if you look at caged, which are whoever still sells them. I I, th I thought they weren't they weren't allowed to strictly. Um... You know, I think they still can, can't they? I don't. Mm, not bat, I don't think so. You're uh, you're uh, you're a bit a uh, bit quiet tonight, uh, oh, man. Richard. Yeah, just you were you were okay in pre preamble, but uh, you've gone quiet. Oh. Anyway, so I thought what I'd, there's a, there's a real reason that I brought this up again. That was just to give you a, a bit of background. There's some new stats uh, from the American Chemistry Society, and they've and they've they're getting very interested in all this. Um, They've they've come up with some stats and they now they now believe that there's n there's going to be 9.6 billion people's stomachs to fill um, in the world by 2050. Uh, the, to to do this, you would need a 73% increase in cattle, uh, which in, in turn would give a 15% increase in greenhouse gases from that cattle. And uh, for every they reckon for every burger, um, or for every, for every half kilogram uh, of of burger meat. Um, it takes about 1,009, uh, no, sorry, 109,000 litres of water to, to supply that half kilo. So this is this is what their, their, their new stats are, and this is why they, they really are starting to plough a lot of money into it. Now, the reason why I brought this up again is because the one thing that I'm, I didn't really touch on in, in the last three times I've talked about it or caught up about it was our very own corn. Corn's... Um, a UK-based um, mycoprotein, so it's a fungi-based product. Um, this was invented uh, where we, well, it was, it was discovered, or the, the, the properties of this fungus were discovered back in um, uh, in 1965 by the guy. You, you, this is probably far too uh, far too old, uh, young. You, you are probably far too young for this, but do you remember a rank J. Arthur Rank organization, the man with the gong at the start of the films. Oh, I've seen it on old films. Yeah. yeah so the Rank organisation used to they used to own Odeon cinemas, mm -hmm. and um, they also ran Covers McDougal, the the flower millers. So, well, you you, you know you you must have heard of McDougal's flower. Mm. No. Okay. No. Anyway, so hero, that's it. So it was it was that um, it was that guy who who found mm. it. Mm. And so the the bloke, um, bloke who owned Rank Films discovered Quarp. Well, it was it was on his land. All right. Uh, mm. They found this fungi on his land, and okay. they they further developed it in uh, in in an ICI lab. So it was, you know, part of Imperial Chemical Industries. Um, but it it like took to the eighties until they actually got something that they could sell. Uh, now the problem with corn corn's always been um, that um, it's never been completely animal free because they've always used uh, egg whites to bind the, um, the the fungi together to make it into bits, you know, mints or chicken bits or whatever. You mean it's not vegan? Well, that, that it's not completely, well, yeah, that, it's always been that problem. Um, but they've now got a range of vegan products that they're coming out with now, so there's no animal products in whatsoever. And, um, and Basically, the the owners of corn put uh, put them up to, up for sale um, uh, in October, and the bidders uh, for for the company were people like the, the owners of Bird's Eye, the owners of Findus, McCain's, oh, Nestle. Just, this is corn. I, I thought corn were owned by Intermedia Capital Group because I've tried to buy shares in them in the past. Yeah, no, they were they were owned by a VC, and the VC is so, is sold it. Right. Uh, and the people who, like Nestle were one of the companies, uh, the company behind Alpro was one of the companies who would... They don't own it now, they've sold it on, right, okay. They've sold it on. The company who owns it now is a, is a, a Filipino company, right. uh, and they're called Nissan, uh, Monday Nissan, and they're the biggest, they make, like they're huge in, in Asia, and they make noodles and all sorts of things like that. And um, it's the one area that they've, that Corn have never, they're in like 23 countries, but they've never been... Uh, in Asia, so they reckon this company is going to be able to take them in the Asia Pacific area, um, and they sold it for um, five hundred and fifty million pounds. 
Uh, and they reckon that in 10 years it's going to be a billion dollar business. So there's there's still there's obviously a, still loads of, of interest in this type of uh, in this type of business. Mm -hmm. So yes, it's, so I just thought. Here's a question for you. I've just thought of what's tofu. Tofu is soya bean curd. All ah, right. So it's soya beans that have been uh, mashed down and pressed, uh, and made into like a a, a milk. Because it's that, that milk. Is that solidified. popular in Asia? Yeah, that's it's see, big you know, in a lot of Asian dishes and stuff. Yeah. I know that's a UK thing. But. Yeah, yeah. No, well, there's, there's actually somewhere. There's actually a place that not far from where where I'm sitting now that actually makes tofu. Yeah. So there's uh, and in fact, Cauldron Foods, who are another one of the big vegetarian um, food uh, manufacturers in the UK, the second biggest after Quorn, their all of their base their um, vegetarian based foods are based on tofu, and they make their own tofu. Mm -hmm. So their veggie sausages are based on tofu and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but yes, so, so uh, yeah, I thought, so I'd, I thought I'd end the year on that because I started like. Yeah. On, on the subject of the sort of like the, the impossible foods, burger and meat yeah. and stuff like that, at what point are they now, given that it's like, you know, like you say, a year on since we talked about this burger? Are they, are they you say they're planning on bringing it to this country, but when? No, the, well, they're planning on bringing the product, product by the end of 2020, 2016. 2016. 2016, they reckon they've, they've got, they'll have a, a reproducible product which they'll be able to pack, package and, and distribute. So they're obviously now. The, the, the final year, I would expect, they are um, making sure that it's reproducible. Um, the marketing mass will be ramping up. Yeah, uh, and, and but not not just mass producible, but uh, also distributable. You yeah. know, because a lot of a lot of products have problems. Like uh, I mean, I remember when um, when Cadbury's did the very first Whisper, they released it in in the northeast as a test, and. Um, and it was like hugely successful. I mean, they, they couldn't keep up with demand, but the main pro you've gone, Ross. <laughs> you've gone dark. Has he just gone off? Have they had a power cut? I bet they've had a power cut. So anyway, so when when Cadbury's had originally reached the, the original whisper, they couldn't keep up with demand, and but, but part of the problem was was um, the the the. The, the the chocolate was so crumbly that it it wouldn't uh, stand up to distribution, mm. so they were losing money on every bar, so they had to take it off the market. And then when they re did it across the country again, it, it changed the the texture and it wasn't half as nice. Yeah, right. But they, ha they had to do that. So the, I guess that's what the guys in Impossible Foods are doing now. So they'll be ramping up marketing. They'll be doing um, they'll be working out where where that ch the that channel distribution channels are. Um, Probably, you know, perfection, perfecting the actual product itself, um, and yeah. But by the end of next year, they reckon that's it. There'll be there'll be a product. Right. So interesting. So anyway, um, uh, so Richard, uh, it's this is yours next, and you've got one. Um, Go on, just on the subject of of foodstuffs. Yeah. See the news that um, the GMO salmon's been given the the green light now. Been a lot of controversy around that. Well, in the UK, um, I don't know if it was in the UK or the US, but it was certainly coming up in my timeline loads about the the for or against arguments because they were taking public comments. The FDA were. Um, See, I, it's very interesting this because Americans really just haven't had the same uh, issues with GM stuff than we that we've had over here. I, 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 well, I hadn't. The, that's the perception anyway. No, I think they. I think they have more of a more of a problem with it. To be honest. But they have, um, they have, but their GM crops are in completely in, um, yeah, in the I, mainstream I now. I don't think that, I don't think that necessarily means the public are on board with it though. I think some of that's just gone through without, without public consultation basically. But it's interesting on the salmon one that um, the arguments for or against that I was reading were basically presented by both sides. The same argument produced. So basically, the against party was saying. Well, do you want, um, you know, Atlantic salmon that's had Chinook salmon's growth hormone and uh, genetic on switch from an ocean pout all put together into one fish? So it's like, that's the against argument. It's like, well, that, I'm sure that's the for argument as well, because that's what they're doing. Um, yeah. But yeah, interesting that um, that basically, get, by doing that, you get a fish that's 
at 18 months old is six point six pounds um instead of two point eight pounds so you get an enormous fish basically by by slicing in those genes and i think um you know it's uh, that that is the main crux of of everybody's uh re- or the people the people who are reticent about g m is that um they don't you don't know when you when you start manipulating genes adding genes from other things to other genes you'll never work at, you will never in such a small timeline you'll not know the effects you know it's, it's only after a long time round uh, you know yeah. a long amount of time really so yeah we i understand why there are issues why they have issues but you just i mean i can understand the concerns around um you know about tail risk if the if the if the organism gets into the environment and knocks it up then then clearly that's a you know what i mean it becomes a, like a super invasive species or whatever i can see that but i don't really get the feeling that that's what the the public who are against gm i get the feeling more that they're against it not for those kind of subtle reasons they're more against just the logical fallacy of argument argument for nature the fact that it's not natural this fish could easily exist naturally but it, it just happens not to so what the what the scientists are doing is just making you know making it more ideal in terms of forming it and the the idea is to form it, not release it into the wild. So, I think a lot. I think a lot of it as well is is the fact that they've they've called it genetic modification. Um, you know, they shouldn't. Have, if they see for 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 hundreds of years, thousands of years, um, farmers have have changed the vegetables. You know, I mean, carrots were not yeah. orange originally. Yeah. yeah. Um, Which and is altering the gene. It is. It is. It is. It is. Not altering it in a laboratory. You're altering it for by by you know a selection you process yeah you so know and we have doing exactly the same thing yeah it's a it's a simplistic way of doing what we do what well, we're I doing in a petri the, dish or something i guess the caution would be that clearly it's going to be more risky to make rapid changes isn't it yeah if you make dramatic changes quickly then i guess that inherently carries more risk doesn't it it does yeah yeah absolutely but then I, you I think... put the controls in place the con- you know what I mean? Whatever you whatever you decide makes it safe. You, you put do those that regardless of the technique, don't you? You put that process in place, yeah. and you make sure people follow it. And you put in uh, if there has to be an organisation to to provide governance, then that's what you have to do. And I mean, I, have- I've got some sympathy with the arguments of like, you know, if we're going to do this, and then that means that animals are even more intensively farmed than they were before. When I when I was watching a program about it, uh, I was saying, well, I don't really have a problem. You know, if you're going to eat salmon. Then I don't really see how this is any worse. In fact, it's not impacting the environment as much because you're not taking wild fish out of the food chain. Uh, um, you know, we've we've talked about speciesism a lot uh, before, and some of that is, you know, I, I still don't understand. Speaking as a like a a, a logical vegetarian, um, I, I think there, there was something on tonight about um, eating insects and stuff, and it's uh, if you get over if you can get people over the factor yeah um it's it's just it's the same as yeah i don't see well i can't in fact any if in my opinion i think it's hard to build build a moral case against eating insects whereas i think it's very very easy to make a moral, moral case against eating pigs so to me if anything we should be we should be driving towards that shouldn't we yeah yeah but yeah, it's yuck, fa- it's yuck factor, isn't it? Really, the people. Yeah. Are making it. It's status yeah. quo and yuck factor that people make their decisions on. And you know, and it's like um, it's all right for us to eat um, the the little piggy, but it's not all right for us to eat um, Fido. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, Ross, it's nice to see you back. Hello. Just a what quick happened? blue, sc- quick blue screen. Quick blue screen. Yeah, mm-hmm. it happens quite often. <laughs> are you still on Windows Ten, by the way? I am, yeah. Yeah, right. Well, I was on Windows 7 and still had a blue screen, so God knows what happened. No, I need to upgrade this computer desperately. Yes. I concur. <laughs> I've been saving. Uh, have you? Oh, bless. Yes. <laughs> right, anyway, we're, we're, we've, been, uh, we've been talking around the topic, but uh, we're going to go to Richard's topic now, which is about... Um, it's a genetic story, and it's can, gene- can genes make us restless? Reckless, even not restless. <laughs> oh, restless! Oh, I'm so restless. Yeah. Uh, this is a study that's been uh, published in Transitional Psychiatry, which is a branch of Nature. 
Um, read it. Read it often. <laughs> uh, My favourite. The study's been done by University of Helsinki on the Finnish population. Ah, uh, the crazy the Finns. Finnish population are good for a study of this type, is because they're quite an isolated population. So there hasn't been much immigration. Um, so the, the gene pools remain relatively steady. So it makes it easier to to select for controls and select for if you're looking for a particular. Um, mutation. So in this case, there's a point mutation uh, in the serotonin 2B receptor, um, which they believe, there's been studies done before, and this is looking into it further, they believe can render the carrier prone to impulsive behavior. So basically, it's a, it's a genetic mutation that results in impulsive behavior that they believe they've found. Um, so they looked at 14 carriers of this um, HTR2B, Q20 um, and 156 healthy controls um, and they used various methods, they used it, the Brown Goodwin lifetime aggression scale, they looked at um, the Michigan alcoholism screening test and also the people's lifetime drinking history. Um, Brown Michigan, and things like that that's as well. so last year. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, looked so, so, so this, this gene, this, this, um, it's a, it's a genetic mutation. Mutation. Yes. And then, but they're not saying that the Finns are the only people who have it. They're just saying that they, they, no, that was a good. Just, this is the first study, and it's been done by Helsinki University. So right. they've looked at the Finnish population. Right. Um, but they've made the point that it, it's a good. The reason that they've done it, it's a good place to do it because of the, the kind of, the steady genetic flow that's in in, in Helsinki. I think we I think we've said before that a lot of the Scandinavian countries have are quite good um, catchment areas for this type of research, especially I think we said Iceland was really good because it was fairly constant. Yeah, there's not been much outside influence. Very little immigration into it. Yeah, yeah. comparison. Yeah. Um, so they looked both at sober, while sober and under the influence of alcohol, because as we know, alcohol has a aggravating effect on, on this in the very least. Um, so, um, so they experiment on drunk people. Yeah, basically. Um, <laughs> so this is um, Ross would be in the catchment for that very well, often. Well, not, <laughs> not experimenting. They're looking at they're looking at a, a questionnaire. They're looking at the person's um, alcohol history and criminal history and things like that. So crimes committed whilst under the influence and crimes committed not whilst under the influence and comparing the two, for example. Um, so they say in this paper, and it's and it's it, it's worth repeating that um, that the impact of, of gene is always overstated by the media. So complex phenomena like this, aggression, behaviour, there's not a gene for it. There's not a gene for this and a gene for that. That's the way that the press um, express it. And we've known for a long time that it's it's that's just a very simplistic way of looking at it. It doesn't really work like that. But this particular mutation um, of a of a receptor. Is, is what we're looking at here, which is genetic, but it's not a gene for. There's yeah. not, you know, there's not a gene for this, a gene for that. That's kind of like a metaphor. Dawkins called his book um, the selfish gene, but <laughs> people who've only read the title are the ones who will say the selfish gene. He explains <laughs> in depth in the book there's no such thing as a gene for selfishness. But but anyway, I think uh, I, I think we we I mean we discussed we've discussed this before that the fact that it's 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 patterns of genes that come together and make you know different outcomes that's right yeah and, but this this receptor in humans is is thought to be linked with with impulsive behavior and it it has been shown to correlate with um a number of mental health problems so mental health problems that are related to having an impulsive nature are already correlated to this receptor um, and the people who've got this mutation um it turns out um that they are they are much more more likely to be impulsive, uh, when so, and also under the influence. You know how you say it's a mutation. Yeah. Is that just because it like what what defines it as being a mutation and not just the way it is, just because less people have it? Well, I guess in the terms of a of a receptor, it behaves in this way in the population. And yeah. It behaves in this way in a subset of the population. Right. So something's happened. 
different um, to the majority. The makeup that makes yeah. it, makes the receptor behave either the uptake or or whatever is is less. So it so the effect of um, serotonin is less in these people basically. See, I'd be interested. I would be interested to have a genetic test and to see if um, if I have that pattern of genes, because I I, I class myself as a very un. Um, a non-reckless person. <laughs> right, you see, After a few drink drinks. No, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm <laughs> I am, I, I'm, ve I'm very cautious and I'm very ca calculated, and I would don't. Well, especially when I try to murder people. Um, <laughs> but, but I, but I, every, I, I do like to um, plan everything to the as much as I can to the end detail. So, just going, yeah, let's do. Do you, you don't know. have an impulse control problem? Well. I don't, not percep my perception is I don't have an impulse control no, problem. my perception is that you don't. But I think um, this paper says that the, the people who are worse than alcohol also, those people are also generally worse while sober as well. But like I said, mm. alcohol seems to be an aggra aggravating factor. So Some sort of catalyst. Be, yeah. It may be in those people's minds that they only do those daft things under the influence of alcohol, but it's probably just that the bar's, the bar's raised up, the bar's lowered so much lower when they're un under the influence of alcohol, but they're probably compared to s compared to the people they're more um, impulsive than with alcohol. They're probably more impulsive than both without alcohol as well. But it's just that it's a, maybe a bit more subtle when they're when they're both sober. Um, but but yeah, basically um, alcohol related and non non alcohol risk behaviour, emotional dysregulation, those sorts of things. So, in terms of this research, were they? How do they know? Like, what triggered the research? Did they discover the gene in people who were like that and wanted yeah. to confirm it, or were they looking for things that that gene people who had that had in common? You know what I mean? Yeah. That's but did they know they were looking for recklessness? There was a previous paper on on this on this receptor's role in impulsive behaviour. Uh -huh. so they then did a. A population follow. study that they got, they identified 14 people with the mutation and 156 healthy people without the mutation. And then they had a look, they had a look at the, their their criminal records and their alcohol history, and their, they brought them in and did them did, did them a survey that gauges how aggressive you are. And so does that, that does this open up to like people using this as a as a way to get off committing crimes? You know, if someone says they weren't like um, compass mentis or they were psychotic at the time or something could they blame it on the genes like is that possible well, well it well it depends on the it depends on the court and whether that could be recognized as that sort of thing but mm -hmm. it's a, it's it is an interesting dilemma isn't it because mm -hmm. you could have a situation where um a book that i've read goes goes into this um which is highly worth reading i think that, I think that might be on my reading list um but it's about the biological causes of crime mm -hmm. and it's it's something that's kind of shunned in the community but but Clearly, the evidence is very strong for it, but the case can be made that, say, somebody commits a murder and they were completely out of character, and then you discover that they have a um, a brain tumor in the region of the brain that controls aggression. Mm -hmm. Is that then, you know, once the tumor is removed, is that then them cured? And therefore, if you then were to sentence them, are you then just um, are you then just punishing them because you're not rehabilitating them if you've then removed the tumor and you know yeah. that tumor caused that action? But the problem it's with that argument is then you find out that people have, you know, you find out a continuum thing like this where people have a mutation yeah. reduces the uptake. Where do you then say what is the norm and what is outside of the norm and exactly. when is it okay, when is it not okay? It gets very difficult, doesn't it? And then, then, then it would open up that whole thing of like, you know, the genetic profiling type thing, sort of preemptively treat people differently because their genes suggest that they'll be more prone to being yeah. aggressive I, and stuff. I was just going to say that. I was just going to yeah. say, if you ever get to the stage where you where you could scan somebody for this, it, it, it like well, you, it, we're already birth. A minority report. We're already at that stage. I believe. I believe that that stage has been reached, and we we could do that now. Oh yeah, you could do it, but 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 it's a moral thing. Would you do it? Because it's obviously it's not going to be a hundred percent evidence that someone will be more violent if they're more prone to it. No, no, and, it's not proof, but it's mm. uh, certainly you you can look at things like. a like a brain scan mm. and you can see a psychopath in a brain scan though that psychopath may not become a serial killer that psychopath mm -hmm. may just become a very good stockbroker but <laughs> you can see the trait you can see the traits 
that that increase tenfold whether this person's going to be a psychopath or not. Yeah. Of course, we all know that being male rather than female increases that risk hugely. <laughs> your, your propensity to crime and especially violent crime is so so much higher by just being a man, and that's clearly clearly a genetic factor. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, I, so th this is just one of the many. Um... It's just one of the many areas where you could cross references with a with the nurture nature debate as well. Yeah. And and um, but and and I always think that it, anything like this, when like we, what you said, Ross, that if you if you prof if you test them for this type of you know or array of, of genetic mutations or, or diseases or whatever uh, at the start of life, does that give them? Sort of like some off the hook thing if they do if they do something later on in life. Well, you mentioned um, nature versus nature. I mean that that isn't a real debate going on in the scientific community. But but the, the book about biological causes goes into that, and examines that, and says right, is this nature? Is this nurture? What is it? And they they did a, like a huge meta analysis of of violent criminals and. And um, well, convicted, convicted violent criminal, and looked at biological factors. So, um, being born very prematurely, or or being starved of nutrition at certain point, you know, critical points in the gest gestation, um, you know, all sorts of things that would make you, you know, being dropped on your head, for example, something like that. So there's all sorts of very, very predictive factors where you can actually look at someone's palm and see. You know, it sounds Palm like reading. it sounds like pseudoscience, but but there is sort of de 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 developmental things that happen on your palm where you can actually see that this doesn't reach doesn't I can't remember them now, but this is sort of like these don't pair up in the right place, and that shows you that you are starved of nutrition during a critical period, and that itself is predictive, very predictive, of whether you're going. It's as predictive as smoking leading to lung cancer. Of violence, yeah, it doesn't get used, and probably because of the concerns that you're on about, it's met with some skepticism for one, but also, you know, do you get into a minority report type situation yeah. where you, you're, you're convicting people of future crimes? But in terms of na uh, nurture, um, then you know, looking at were the parents alcoholics, were they abusive, was the child abused, was the child abandoned, was there no father, etc., etc., um, those have a higher cor correlation effect, as you would expect as well. But what's most interesting is if you combine the two, so you have these these factors that are biological mixed with, so you have someone who's starved of, you know, nutrients during during development, and also alcoholic parents who then abandon them and whatever or abuse them. The two things together, it just it's it's out of the that their chances of being a violent criminal is just way mm -hmm. way way higher. So. So it's both basically the the two. If you if you put the two things in, it's a very heady mix for that. But you, that's what you'd expect, isn't it? If you have yeah. someone who's, in this case, has a poor serotonin uptake and is also an alcoholic, it's a recipe for disaster, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. <laughs> Richard's stories always end up on a on a down. I'm, I'm glad we didn't. Le I didn't. I'm glad I didn't finish on Richard. <laughs> right. Okay. Well. well it's not a downer. It's not a downer because what it's saying is I feel pretty down. <laughs> what would you rather just not know about any of this and we just <laughs> violent criminals are just we don't know why they commit crimes. We don't even look at. We don't even want to look. Can you not find some about. genetic research on the gene for happiness? Sorry, the genetic trait for happiness. <laughs> well, you've already got that by looking at this gene, haven't you? So by by looking at a, a mutation that causes a negative effect, then you. Do something that promotes the positive effect, don't you? But you don't, you don't look, you don't look for the control group. You look and hence, for the hence, hence, the obvious thing is to get all of those people that have that trait, round them up, put them in a the field. Uh, there's a Kenny Everett thing in there. <laughs> <laughs> but see, but see, you found out that that um, I don't know, consuming a certain product, you know, or smoking, smoking during pregnancy led to this. It would be a good reason, and another good reason, not to do that, wouldn't it? Yeah. So you, you could you could find out that to to be more happy, you you avoid smoking in the third trimester, and therefore you have better serotonin um, uptake, and your life's better. 
Yeah, I'm just thinking actually, obviously, the, the whole sort of low serotonin levels leading to risk taking and aggression and all this sort of thing makes sense to sort of, you know, that, that thrill seeker type thing. If you had excessive levels of serotonin, so it didn't take much for you to get that reward back in your brain, would you just be really lazy? Yeah, yeah. You just get really excited about an advert, and then that would be your day done. And also, uh, and also, I think it's toxic. So large amounts of it is is very bad for you as well. Yeah. Mm. So, but I mean, isn't that a bit what you know, a heroin addict is basically doing? Mm. Yeah, true. So basically, and then you know we've talked about this before with the experiments on animals, where they then neglect. You know, if you take it to the extreme and you get that reward, 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 yeah. um, then you just neglect everything else, which is what mm -hmm. a heroin addict basically does. Yeah. Those are the the, the, the physiological effects of the heroin, but part of it is just the, the, the reward-seeking behavior. Yeah. Then just reward-seeking um, of something that actually is not, it's just Reward. giving you a kick. It's not actually, you know, you know what I mean? Evolution's evolved it to try and give you a kick for doing yeah. the things, finding calories so you can survive, and you can reproduce. If you're just getting the kick and you're not getting the calories and you're not getting the nutrition, then you it's just an empty, it. an empty cycle, isn't it? Then you just... Just seeking the reward without getting any benefit. Yeah. Mm. Excellent. You would be lazy. Be lazy. <laughs> Excellent. Right. Cool. Um, yeah. So, is there any? Is there any further? Do, does it say whether there's any further um, investigations, research going on after that? Um, after that? Like, well, like a lot of these studies, the authors responsibly have said, small pool. Um, we would suggest the larger, the larger study, another study somewhere else. Um, just to reaffirm the finding. Um, so this is kind of like a, a second attempt to look at the finding. Um, but the next thing to do is to have so a hopefully this is, separate group reproduce. Hopefully this is a call to other research groups to, to take it on and I mean, try it's and re kind of reproduce. It's definitive now that, that this receptor is responsible for for these behaviours, but whether or not this particular finding can be replicated remains. Cool. Excellent. Good stuff. Um, right, now, the last one of the evening is Ross, and Ross is going to take us to somewhere very cold in the universe. Yes, the coldest place in the universe. Um, where, where do you think it is? Well, it was fairly cold outside my front door this morning. Mm-hmm, no. I don't know, it's a black hole where it is, can, can, can heat escape, I don't know. No, no. Um, so, well, w one would presume it's the furthest part away from the sun. Well, funnily enough, no. Um, oh, the obvious okay. answer would be, you know, the middle of space where there's nothing, basically. But the the, the temperature of space is actually 2.7 Kelvin, which that's the ambient temperature of space. So that's, so that's, that's basically a constant, it. is it? That's sort of, sort of that's the lowest temperature that oh, space right, okay. gets to. Um, so that's 2.7 degrees above. A lot cooler, somewhere near absolute zero, then. Yeah. Um, so that 2.7 degrees Kelvin is basically like the afterglow of the Big Bang. You know, you, you get like the, the uh, cosmic background radiation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's basically what the temperature of that is. Right. Um, so yeah, no, the, the, the coldest place in the universe is actually on Earth. Um, and um, it's in an underground laboratory lab in Italy. Now, I say coldest place. There, there are, there are, are sorry, scientists have made things colder but only on very, very small scale. Now, this is basically a, a machine that's about the size of a vending machine. Um, and what they've done is they've actually cold, cold down, chilled down, um, a, a cubic meter space um, to six micro Kelvin. So basically 0 0.006 Kelvin is the temperature of this meter, cubic meter space. So that's minus 273.14 degrees. So and they did it for... We've made something colder than we've been able to discover occurring naturally then. Yeah. Basically, that they can make things colder than exist naturally. Um, and they've done it for 15 days as well. So it's not just sort of like one of these experiments where they do something quickly and then, you know, it's, it's a brief, brief moment. It's a 15-day it's a long experiment. So they haven't, they haven't done it... F Done the ex done a, reduced it for 15 days. They've actually it's been 15 days of the same temperature continuously. Yeah. yeah. Right. So it's the lowest temperature in the universe over a, over such a big volume. Like I say, they they they've got smaller areas 
even colder, I think two microkelvin. But because this is a meter, a cubic meter, it's it's big enough to do decent size experiments in. Does the um, stop stuff touching other stuff then? Presumably that's the. Well, for for this one, basically, the, the, this experiment is for um, studying neutrinos. Um, and basically, um, it's it's in Italy, and it's called the Cryogenic Underground Observatory for Rare Events. Um, and like I say, what they're, what they're looking for is neutrino um, interactions, and they're looking for something called what is it? Uh, Mar Marjorana fermions, which are apparently uh, decays of neutrinos where they create their own antiparticles. Um, and basically, the, what was interesting, I was reading about this, and what was interesting about how they actually do the cooling process, um, they actually use uh, something called um, di dilution refrigeration. Um, and what they do is they get a mixture of helium-3 and helium-4, so two isotopes of helium. Um, and when they, they cool them down using sort of more traditional refrigeration effects, but what happens is you get um, the... the Helium-3 is lighter than the helium-4. And at the interface, what happens is you get sort of um, phase dilution. So the helium-3 sort of dilutes into the helium-4. And when that happens, it takes a little bit of energy. And then what they have is a sort of a pump that pumps from the other end back into the top, which sort of depletes the concentration of helium-3 in the helium-4. And then it replenishes again by itself. So that sort of natural process of the... The, what I was I was watching a video and they were explaining this cooling in terms of how you cool soup. So if you imagine you've got a hot um, hot bowl of soup and you cool it down, you blow over the top of it. What you're doing is you're removing all of the vapor from the top, and then the sort of the the hot and the cold tries to balance out again. So the heat leaves the soup into the air above it. So you're not actually cooling the soup by blowing on it. You're, you're cooling the soup by removing the heat from above it. Put the space for the, uh, the other air to move into. Exactly, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and it's basically it's it's that sort of um, um, process that they use to cool down to these temperatures. Um, but I was I was looking at one of the other um, uses for cold temperatures, like you, you mentioned, what they're looking for. Uh, there's another experiment where they have a it's a round um, sort of metallic ball that they cool down. Uh, what they're actually looking for in that experiment was looking for gravitational waves. So gravitational waves are, are theoretical. They, 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 they're trying to observe them directly now. So basically when I don't know, a neutron star explodes somewhere, they think there's a wave caused in the fabric of space, which then passes through space. So they're trying to detect these. Um, and what they're doing, they're cooling down this experiment to try and basically remove any thermal vibrations um, because the effect of the gravitational waves are on the scale of 10 to the minus 20 meters. So that's how small these sort of tiny vibrations caused by gravitational wa waves are. Um, and they're trying to detect that, so they need to remove all the heat because obviously heat is, is vibration of, of atoms. So if they, if they prove... Um that there is such thing as a, a gravitational wave, does that um, improve the chances of us getting some sort of anti-gravity engine? Um, I'm not sure what you could do with it. I think it's more. I think it's more just theoretical. I don't know what 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 the outcome of discovering these and proving them would be directly. Because um, obviously, I one suppose knowing that the fabric of space can be. Distorted, yeah. I suppose that helps. Because, uh, because obviously, if we ever, if we're ever going to try and do what they did in Star Wars, um, we'd, we, 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 that we was have a to... long time ago, and it was a galaxy far, far away. Well, I've heard that. <laughs> I've heard that rumor. Um, but yeah, but there must be some that that it's we have to we have to be able to manage gravity, haven't we? I mean, that's that's how you get to places to the other side of the universe very quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Man, sort of manipulate it so you're falling, falling forward really fast. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, but I mean, I suppose theoretically that that's all possible, but it's just you look into the amount of energy that that would involve to doing it. It's yeah, and then you look into practical. what is theoretically possible, and you think, hmm. <laughs>
There's all sorts of the arrow of time theoretically can be changed, but uh, you know. <laughs> it's taken us a hell of a long time just to get back to the moon. So the chances of us ever getting to that <laughs> is like so. So essentially, the challenge is to get to get it to get these what did you say neutrinos to to vibrate as little as possible, and that can, essentially that's what you're doing by cooling it down, then. Yeah, basically, if if you if you cool things down, you can get rid of the sort of the natural vibration and see see things happening in more detail. I think. So the less so the the less you get them to vibrate, therefore the the measurement of its temperature goes down. That is the me, that is the measurement of vibration then. Yeah, the, the the less the temperature has an effect on stuff, and the more other things can be observed. Yeah. yeah. I don't understand the the thing where you're saying like about how essentially it's using a ventilation technique basically. How, if if that's the coldest thing already, I was then sort of venting it, making it colder. That's I'm, I'm not getting. Well, that 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 between the two phases between the helium three and the helium four, as as the helium three goes into the helium four, that takes energy. Right. So that in at that interface, right. there's a constant energy going out of that particular thing. Yeah. Um, and uh, that just goes colder and colder and colder. Because it's removing energy, basically. It's a bizarre thought, isn't it? Yeah. That you could, that you could, yeah. But that's the way to think of it, isn't it? That you're just reducing the energy. But yeah, yeah. I, I sort of just the way, that, the, the sort of intuitive way that you think of, which isn't the way to think of these sorts of things, I suppose. But so the intuitive way you think of temperature, how can you, how can exposing it to something else that's not colder than it already make it colder? Just, just intuitively doesn't work does it yeah i think i think because we a lot of the stuff that we that they do in science is they um they're 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 crashing different particles together and getting off more energy or they're getting off heat mm -hmm. or light so and obviously that's raising the temperatures but to do it in the opposite direction and get something that's even colder as the as the you know the summation of the two interactions well, that's the thing. You, 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 yeah, all you, all you need is a process that, that that requires energy to do, and that happening will will reduce temperature. If as long as as long as it's not an explosive thing, you know, um, because it's a sort of a chemical chemical process, chemical phase transition, or whatever you call it. Um, yeah, it, it 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 takes energy to do that. Yeah. So therefore, anything. It takes energy from its surroundings, basically. So you put something around it, and it will it will get colder. Take something that's already not very energetic and try and remove more energy from it. Yeah, yeah. So on the scale of this, where where does liquid nitrogen then submit the as a frame of reference that people are familiar with? Where is that on this scale? Not, not even cold. Liquid nitrogen, I assume, is going to be I don't know minus. I don't know, total guess minus fifty or something. I don't know. But I mean, that's where a... like compared to the. So that's something that's naturally occurring. And, and so where these experiments are at now, I'm just wondering how far we've come from, it? from something that naturally occurs on Earth to where we are now. Are we much, much colder than that? Or? Well, liquid nitrogen doesn't occur naturally on Earth. I don't think. I think that has to be, you know, you have to liquefy the gas. Let's have a look. Right. So I mean, minus 50 is going to be far too high, isn't it? Yeah. How, what I mean is something that's been around a while then, how, how are these new yeah. techniques, how far have we advanced? Liquid nitrogen is minus 195. Okay, and so what Kelvin or Celsius? Uh, Celsius, so it's 77 Kelvin. Right. Okay. 77 Kelvin, and where and where's this where's this experiment at at the moment? This is six micro Kelvin. So it's it's a hell of a big improvement. So yeah, yeah, and obviously it's going to be one of these things. You know, cooling something down from room temperature by 20 degrees is not difficult. Cooling something down from 77 Kelvin to zero, near enough. Yeah. Is going to be very, very difficult. Yeah, and, um, now you're into the... and especially on such a big scale, like I say, a cubic meter is a huge amount of space to yeah. basically remove all of the energy from. So now they're um, in the sub sub one zone. It's diminishing returns like massively. Yeah, yeah. Unless they come up with a new technique. Yeah, I'm just trying to this. This is it. Is is it a new technique then? I don't think it's a new technique. No, the actual sort of technique's quite. I think it's been quite. Is it, is well, it I think it's just on this scale. Where they're actually now got the gear to do it, then. Yeah, yeah, basically, yeah. I mean, I think it's one of these things where, effectively, if, if you actually look at the 
they're probably doing this sort of like Russian doll type thing where they'll have one inside another one and another one and another one. So it'll be like doing the same process multiple times to sort of build it up. So basically, right? So if we can get something down that cold, you know, you know where we, um, I, I don't know whether you were he, here, Ross, but um, where we talked about black phosphorus. Yeah, I think I was. Yeah, you were here, or was it you that Richard really weren't here? I think it was me. I don't remember that. Oh, yeah, you know, we we talked about graphene and uh, and black phosphorus and um, just a, a, a couple of months ago. Oh yeah, mm. no, it was when I wasn't here because I remember watching it. Yeah, and 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 but one of the one of the issues is you've got to get it down really cold. Um, you know, this that, this is this sound this is sounding good for things like that. Yeah. So just looking at, at the, the 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 records for for coldness. So um, the world, current world record was, ac was actually set in 1999. And then the temperature, they, they got down a piece of, just a, a tiny piece of rhodium metal, and that was to 100 picokelvins, which is 0 0.9 zeros and a 1 of a Kelvin. Imagine how long your food would keep. <laughs> <laughs> just keep forever. Yeah. And is this is this was this a bit of copper? Did you say ro ro rhodium? No, no, for this one. But I mean the well, one in Italy. Well, it's it, well, it's it's no, it's it's a, it's an actual space. It's a one cubic meter size space. So it's, it, it's, it's, it's the actual air, effectively. Well, it won't be air; it'll be a vacuum. Um, but yeah, it's 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 a it's a space where they can observe stuff. I assume if they put put a piece of metal into it, it would probably not get down to that oh, temperature. Yeah. I don't know. I'm sure I saw something about they said something about copper in that in that I same. I, um, I wonder if I have a hard time measuring it then. The, no, I, using the instruments to measure it must. It must yeah, how do they actually measure the temperature without well? Without interfering with it. Without interfering with it, yeah. Well, I don't I don't know what they use for actually yeah, measuring I, it. I found this I found this article which is the same thing. It's the Curie. Curie, yeah. 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 And it says the coldest pla known place in the universe is a block of copper in Italy. So it's a copper. Or is it actually a copper? It's a world record by cooling a copper vessel with a volume of cubic meter. Ah, right. Okay. Yeah, so it's that. The it's the same thing. Things copper. Yeah. Yeah, the vessel. Shield copper. Shielded copper. All oh, right. Okay. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. Wow. You survive in there. <laughs> God, we've learned stuff this this we've learned stuff this time. Real oh, okay. real stuff. I wonder, I wonder Excellent. Was... And do you know what the what the research and development project's called? The acronym the acronym is absurd. <laughs> and that stands for a background surface rejection detector. They aim they aim to develop a scintillating bolometer. Oh <laughs> they are we scintillated bolometers. <laughs> With the ability to veto ionizing background radiation. Yeah. Wow. The absurd project to build a scintillating bolometer. Nobody can ever say that you don't learn stuff on the Word of Stuff. <laughs> you know, you do. Every week we learn stuff. I learn stuff every week. Do you learn stuff every week, Ross? Do you learn every stuff, week. Richard? Every week, every week. <laughs> anyway, well, that is, that is probably episode 51 coming to a, a nice conclusion there. Not too far over time. We've done very well, chaps. So um, uh, next week, uh, there's going to be much frivolity and uh, exultation and, and, and celebrations because it is the birthday. Uh, it is our 52nd episode. We have been, we would have been going for an entire year. Is that going to be an cake? Earth year, obviously. Is there going to be cake? Cake. Is it, hang on, is it, it's our 52nd episode or have we been going a year? Cause surely well, we're well look, I, I'm saying that we do one a week. So right. there are fifty-two weeks in the year. If, if the exact date, we've actually probably passed it, because <laughs> it was in November couple, sometime. We had a couple of weeks off at Christmas, didn't we? Yeah, you see. So I'm I'm do, going by the episode, the number of episodes, because it'll be much easier to follow for the second birthday. Because <laughs> because the the actual date was well. Hang on, let me just uh, just talk amongst yourselves and play some music, everybody. <laughs> so Ross, I'm far on the way to getting it from the point where it's as cold as balls. As cold as balls. <laughs> Brass monkey weather. <laughs> You're cold. 
I thought you said it's co- as cold as walls. Balls. <laughs> well, this ice cream's not that cold. <laughs> uh, right, okay, so the first one was... Uh, oldest, oldest, yeah. Uh, what the hell? Where is it? Episode one, a year ago. The handle E just says a year ago. <laughs> I could have told you that. <laughs> but the second one actually says a year ago as well. Yes. God, that's not very good. Let me see. Um, dude, um, um, just... Episode 11 was on the 8th of uh, February, if that helps. Thanks, for us. Just, just in case you... That's stunning. Stunning insight. Hang on, I'll have to go inside. Hang on. I'm going in, chaps. Maybe some... Oh, God. I don't like this new interface that... Uh, the... 22nd of November, 2014. Oh, well, so it was last week, actually. Because we missed one, didn't we, for the episode, yeah. it's not an episode. So, this is our, this is, well, last week was our official birthday, this is our ceremonial birthday, like the Queen. <laughs> well, I can't believe we missed my birthday. <laughs> I can. We've not been we've not been particularly well organised, let's be honest here. <laughs> Yay! Yay! Oh now now we've started. No, let's get let's, oh, no, let's start. Let's no, start. we'll be on for another half an hour. <laughs> Leave it till next week. John's suspiciously quiet. Oh, there we go. Right, John. <laughs> okay, everybody. <laughs> Say bye bye, chaps. Bye bye, chaps. See you next time. Same bad time. Same bad channel. <laughs> See you, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>